Okay, show of hands. How many of you uh, actually saw the new Star Wars trailer this week? <sighs> wow. Literally like six people. How many of you couldn't care any less about Star Wars? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, since I have the microphone and am leading this time, we're just going to go ahead and shut everything down and pray for you people for the rest of the night. Well, hey, uh, my name's Steve Kerr, and, and I am really happy um, you're here. And um, I'm wrestling with this headpiece here for a minute. That's cool. It's wonderful. We're just going to set this over here in, in a flipping pan. There we go, the pan that did all the flipping. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're kicking off our, our new series. Uh, actually, it's really our, official, our first official full series as a, a group, as a youth group tonight um, because... Um, because it's that time, right? Like we went through uh, with the whole church, the, the code. If you take a look over here, you'll see the six codes of, of who we are, who we believe you are uh, as well. And, and I would say that to me, um, I don't know about you, but when it comes to the codes, I actually have favorites. I, I don't know if you know that's allowed, but it is. Um, <laughs> and so I have a favorite. Um, what I want to do right now is I want to know, just take a survey. How many of you believe that the first code is my favorite? Just raise your hand. You believe Driven by New Life is my favorite code. How many of you, put your hands down, how many of you believe Multiply is my favorite code? How many of you believe Whatever It Takes, Wherever It Takes Us is my favorite code? How many of you believe Relentless Pursuit of One More is my favorite code? How many of you believe Encounter Jesus is my favorite code? All right, put your hands down. How many of you believe You Belong? This is my favorite code. You know me. By far, by far. I, and I love all of them, so please don't misunderstand me. You belong. You belong is at the very heart of who I am as, as an individual. So that's my favorite, and that means absolutely nothing to you. I hope you have a favorite. If you do have a favorite of those six, I would love to hear it. So stop me out there and, and tell me or tell Abby, whoever. We would love to hear that. But uh, anyways, yeah, so I'm glad you're here, and, and, and more importantly than anything, I want you to know the reason I'm glad you're here, and the reason I start every week that I have this microphone by saying I'm excited is because I believe you belong. I really, really mean that. There is nothing you can do or you have done outside of showing up and being part of this that would... Um, that would cause me to say anything other than you belong. I want you here, and we want you here. And, and a big reason for that personally is because I spent so many years as a teenager searching for a place to belong because I, I definitely didn't feel like I belonged with my family, and I often felt alone and like I didn't belong with my friends, and so belonging has been just such a big deal for me in my life. It's because of that belonging that I was actually able to find my identity, where I could trust God with my identity. And so tonight, we're kicking off a series. We're kicking off a series that has everything to do with identity. And here's what I know, and here's what I want to take a minute just to convince you if I can. I believe more than any other time in my life and any other moment of my life that there is someone in this room tonight that desperately needs to hear this word from God. And I also believe that if you hear it, if you will allow yourself to open up your heart, if you will open up, that God is going to use you. Not only is he going to transform your life, but he's going to use your life to transform the lives of others. And so I plead with you tonight. If any other night you have never done this tonight, I plead with you, please pay attention, listen, hear the words, let the words saturate your mind and your heart because this series matters. We're kicking off a series and it's titled Masked, which is all about Halloween. Actually, that's not true at all. It has nothing to do with Halloween. Come on, people, it's church. Mask. Uh, or, but, but seriously, by a show of hands, how many of you actually enjoy dressing up? How many of you, like, whether it's, like, Halloween or you're, like, part of the drama or whatever it is, like, you, you enjoy dressing up? All right, put your hands down. I do. I seriously do. And my whole life, like, some of my best memories as a kid, I'm going to totally give my age away here. Some of my best memories as a kid was putting on my favorite 
ET mask, and then, <laughs> and then putting on a little blanket, squatting down like this and going, ET phone home. That was like my, my junk. And so my siblings would get so frustrated with me. And my brother Ben, who's just like a year and a half older than I, almost two years older than I am, my brother Ben, like, I would do that, and he would just, like, come and, like, kick or knock me over. Like, shut up and go home. And my sister, even though I was, like, pretending and dressed up as this alien, I, I mean, obviously I wasn't an alien, but my sister would, like, totally argue that fact with you. And she would all the time tell me, man, Steve, you are so freaking weird. Like, you have, have just, like, mastered the art of being weird. Can you just go away? And I was like... E.T. phone home. That's how I responded. But I, I enjoyed wearing masks and still do. Some of you know that. I enjoy costumes. I have a sweet Darth Vader costume. It is legit. It is the real deal. Um, but, I, but I enjoy that. And I think, like, as, as I've thought about masks and I've thought about how I enjoy dressing up, and I, I've come to this conclusion, and I'm going to say something, and I think it's a pretty bold statement, and you can get mad at me if you want. That's okay. But I think that every person in this room, I think that every person in this room has worn a mask at some point in their life that wasn't a Halloween prop, that wasn't part of a show or a parade, but was more about protecting yourself. I think that if we're really honest, a vast majority, I would be bold to say all of us, but a vast majority of us would be honest if we acknowledge that we have used masks, masks that we have created, our own masks that we've created, to hide who we really are. Maybe you wanted to be accepted into a group of people, and so you put on the mask of being a person who enjoyed video games or enjoyed comic books or actually liked school. But, but it was not real. It's, you're pretending to be somebody you're not. Or, 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 or maybe you didn't want people to know that you were part of a group, right? And so maybe rather than letting people know that you are in fact a Christian and you consider yourself a Christian, you put on a mask where you're like, yeah, I don't know what I really believe. I don't know if I really believe the Bible is what Christians claim it to be. Because you didn't want to be associated with those people, and so you put on a mask. Or maybe you've put on a mask to hide the things that have hurt you. Maybe somebody's betrayed your trust. Maybe a parent has hurt you by calling you a name that's not your name. Maybe somebody has lied to you. Maybe somebody has hurt you, and rather than dealing with those feelings of hurt, you've put on a mask to disguise and to hide from that hurt. Or maybe... Sometimes on Wednesdays when you show up here, maybe on Saturday or Sunday when you show up at the mix or part of Life Church, you wear that good Christian mask. You know that mask that you put on so that nobody knows what you're really struggling with? Nobody knows about the abuse or the lying. Nobody knows about the computer and what you're looking at. Nobody knows about that relationship or that false identity that you've created on social media. And so you wear the mask. You wear this mask pretending to be someone you're not. I think most of us, as we process that, we would have to acknowledge that there are some really big reasons why we hide behind mask. Maybe it's because we're afraid we'll be mocked. We'll be mocked for our beliefs. Maybe it's because we'll be made fun of. Maybe it's we're afraid that if we tell everybody that we still love Paul Petro, boom, people will make fun of us. Am I really the only fan of Paul Petro? Thank you, people. Or maybe, maybe it that hurt that you're hiding. Maybe you're hiding that because you're afraid that somebody will use it to hurt you yet again. And so we hide these really big hurts. We hide. But here's what I know. Hiding doesn't help. Hear me. Listen. Hiding doesn't help. Surrender does. 
hiding behind masks, pretending to be something we're not or pretending to be someone we're not or feel something we don't feel doesn't help. What does help is surrender. And you might hear me say that and you might go, what? Surrender is helpful? No, 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 Steve. I think you, you misunderstand the whole point of surrender. Because you understand, not me, you understand surrender to be giving up. And that's not what I understand surrender to be. Surrender to me means giving in. Giving in. And I want to invite you to give in, to surrender to God tonight. Because when we do that, when we surrender to God, we will actually become less afraid of being hurt. And that's not just an opinion. That's a fact. You want to know why? Because God knows you. Do you understand that? I just want to, I'm going to stop for a minute. We're going to get into this weird moment. I want you to understand something right now. God knows you. He knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows your failures. He knows your sin. He knows your brokenness. He knows your dreams and your hope. He knows your successes. And you know what he does? Loves you. God loves knows you, and he loves you. He loves you. Yeah, that's right. God of the universe, the God of the universe, knows you and still loves you more than anything else he created. Wow. You think about that? Just take a minute and think about that for a second. God knows right now how afraid you are of your secrets being found out, and he loves you. He loves you. So since we're in this series called Masks, we're going to deal with a few different masks, and we're going to name them. We're going to call them names. And so tonight we're going to talk about the very first mask, and it's the mask that I know for a fact every person in this room has worn this mask. In fact, I believe that I can confidently say, Jazz, 50% of the people that are in this room tonight have actually donned this mask. They put this mask on at some point today. You ready? The name of that mask is I'm Fine. I'm fine. How many of you have ever found yourself responding to someone when they asked, hey, how are you doing? You just respond with that automated donning of the mask of, I'm fine. How you doing, Steve? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not, not, not going to like let myself you know, share with you the, the fear and worry or, or struggle or challenges I have. I'm not going to talk to you about the, 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 the impending math test that's coming up that I really haven't studied for and I struggle with it because guess what? I don't like math and I don't even understand why we need math outside of adding and subtracting because all that other stuff of math is just like just nerdy people trying to be nerds for the sake of nerding. Ooh, I just went on a rant about math. Yes, right. Ironically, though, my wife, like, loves math. It's her favorite subject. Anyways, but the I'm fine mask. And why do we do this? Why? Why do we do this? And I'm not talking about strangers that we run into at, like, the, the gas station or, or in the bathroom at school. I'm talking about our friends, our family, the people that love us, our small group leaders. Why is it when they ask us how we're doing, we respond with wearing the mask of I'm fine when we're not? Not all the time, but sometimes. I think the reality is it's because it's scary. It would be scary to confess to someone that we're actually struggling with a sin. It would be scary to confess to someone that we're actually struggling with God. Like, I show up to church, I hear, I hear Steve talk, I hear the pastors talk on the weekend, and I just don't know if I understand this. I don't know if I believe this, but you know what? I'm just going to go through the motions because it would be far too hard and way too scary to confess to someone that I don't know if I believe this stuff about Jesus. So we hide behind the mask rather than confessing what we're dealing with. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now pay attention to this next part of this scripture. We're going to come back to it a couple times. Listen to this. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. 
See, James is telling us that confession to a righteous person can lead to healing. And this isn't just James' opinion. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. And so God is telling us that that, that prayer from a righteous person has the power to produce wonderful results. But we have to confess. Now, you might be just hitting the pause button right there and going, okay, Steve, so get to the point where you tell us about or, or, or you identify, identify for us the righteous person. Because I'm looking around the room, Steve, and I'm not sure that I see any righteous people. I'll get to that here in a minute. But before we do that, let me ask you a question. When you hear that word confession, what do you think? What is it that, that comes alive in your mind? What is it that comes alive in your heart when you hear the word confession? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just in your mind, pay attention to these questions and and answer them for yourself. How many of you, when you hear confession, think of guilt? How many of you, when you hear the word confession, think of shame? How many of you, when you hear the word confession, think of punishment and wrath? What if confession means something else? What if confession means that we open up? What if confession is really about us opening up? What if James is telling us that when we open up, that when we open up to a righteous person and there is prayer, that that prayer has power to produce some wonderful results? You see, I think that some of us, we have been so conditioned. And I'm not interested in pointing blame. I'm sure every person in this room has some story in their family or a friend who has violated your trust and has caused you to doubt people's uh, intentions. And so you're like, I'm not going to open up to anybody. That's part of the problem, Steve. I'm, I'm scared. But what if we actually learned that confession was about opening up? About taking off the mask. About not hiding who we are what we're going through, what we're dealing with, what we're feeling, how then should we, how then can we open up? Because I really believe, you guys, sincerely, I really believe that this is something very hard to do. Not only for teenagers, but for every person in this room. It is so hard to open up. Some of us, we've been wearing masks for so long, we can't even begin to Think about what it might look like to not wear a mask every day. And we know we're not being real, but the fake version, the mask that I wear, is so much more comfortable than the thought of being hurt by someone or rejected by someone for being authentic. That's what we tell ourselves. But I just want to ask you a question. Is that really true? Are you really experiencing that? You know, like, I I have so many conversations with you all, teenagers, and and even everyone in the room. Let's just say that. Everyone in the room. And there's, like, a common theme of loneliness. 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 And I wonder how much of that loneliness is induced by us wearing masks and not being authentic with people. By not opening up. If we're not going to be open and and be authentic with people, then of course we're going to feel lonely. Of course we're going to feel lonely. So if we're going to open up, and most most of us have spent the majority of our life trying to hide those things or being cautious with who it is we open up, then we're going to have to learn how to do this. And I believe that God has given me a very clear, simple three things we can do, three application points in a a way that we can actually open up and experience God's freedom in that surrender. So, number one, everybody look at your neighbor and say, one. Oh, come on. Say it like you're a DJ on a radio station. Say, one. Number one, how do we open up? Number one, here's how we open up. Ready? Let God tell you who you are. Let the words of God tell you who you are. I don't know if you have ever heard this uh, before. Maybe you have and maybe you haven't. Maybe it's just a reminder. I don't know. But do you know God is the creator of all things? And so when somebody creates something, when something creates something, it alone has the authority 
to call it by what its purpose is, to call it, to name it for what it is. And, and, I, and I don't mean your name name, I mean who you are. So God, the creator of all things, this is some of the things that he calls you. He says you are a child of him. You're a child of the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of all things. You are a branch to the true vine. You are redeemed. You are accepted. You are a saint. You are a holy temple. You are a new creation. And you are a friend of Jesus Christ. What if we stopped letting the world tell us who we, we are? What if we stopped letting even our, our, our parents or, or in their hurt? What if we stopped letting people with their, 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 their abusive language? What if we stopped letting people hurt us with their words? And what if we actually went to God for our identity? And some of you have wonderful parents. I, I want to believe I'm a wonderful parent. I want to believe that Israel knows that every day that I look at him and say, Israel, Nathaniel, you have been created in the image and likeness of God. You are a prized possession. You are part of a royal priesthood. I want them to know that that's not because dad says it. That's because God says it. So I want to believe I'm a good parent. Maybe you have good parents. Maybe your parents are telling you that. Do you believe that? Or are you busy out there in the culture believing that, they're, that, that you are whatever they say you are? That you're identified by your pleasure. That you're identified by your age. That you're identified by your preferences. That you're identified by your feelings. I'm going to say that again. That you are identified by your feelings. You see, when we do that, if, if, if we believe culture, if we believe the world when it identifies us, then we absolutely will wear masks to survive because we're confused. But when we know, when we know that we are a child of the one true living God, then we can be confident in taking off those masks and knowing the truth about who we are. You can open up knowing that God gets to define you because you were created by him and you belong to him. Galatians 5.1 says this. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I believe there are people in this room right now that we are living our lives enslaved to false identities. We're letting the world tell us who we are. We're letting our, our, our addictions and our hurts and our habits define who we are. You don't have to be a slave. Jesus came to set us free. Number two, the second way that we can experience opening up Find a godly person whom you trust and start small. You guys remember back in that passage of James that we read about the righteous person? Well, check this out. I want you to know something. You see, there, there are some people here that are part of this community that are, are totally committed and sold out for you and the gospel. There are people who wholeheartedly believe that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is who he says he is, and that you, however old you are, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and on, have purpose. And so what we have done, what Abby and Steve and our team, our pastoral team have done, is we have helped these adults in the room who have no motive, no agenda outside of what I just said, that they love you and they love God, be here and be present for you. So when you ask me, Steve, where is a righteous person? I want to do two things. One, I want to tell you what a righteous person is not. A righteous person is not perfected. A righteous person is one that knows what it takes to open up. And so I challenge you, look your small group leaders in the eye and ask them, are you opening up? Are you being your authentic self? Are you part of a small group? Are you committed to these codes in community with Christ? Are you part 
of what's going on here? Are you faithfully pursuing Jesus? I believe they are. So much so that I spend all my time and energy helping them continuously develop and be that righteous person, not only for you, for their own families, but I'm telling you right now with full confidence that they are the righteous people that God has brought to you in your life right now. Your small group leaders, your volunteers, the people committed to this youth group. There are over 100 people that make up serving teenagers in this community. Over 100 people. And of those 100 people, um, yeah, like 2% actually have a job doing it. So don't tell me there's nobody who loves you. Don't tell me that there's nobody available. There's no righteous person for you to open up with you because that's not true. They're here. And remember that little start small thing? Here's the deal. And I know what it's like because I remember, I remember meeting with Alex Rahill, my youth pastor, I remember thinking like, oh man, he's going to sit me down and he's going to ask me about my parents and then I'm going to have to tell him about that thing that I did, that thing that I smoked that I shouldn't have, I don't have to talk to him. And we sat down and you know what happened? We talked about football. Day one, we talked about football. We started small. We started small. Because when you create relationships with people, you don't have to jump in and have a full-on confessional. There needs to be relational currency that's built. And so these adults in this room, the people that are committed to this community, they have committed to that, to take slow steps with you. So tell them, like, hey, Sean, a.k.a. Moses. Hey, Jess. I would love to grab coffee sometime. And you don't have to meet them for coffee and then have a big confessional. You can just meet them for coffee and say, hey, thanks for taking time and and really for buying me coffee or pizza, whatever it is. But start small. And there's reward in that. Just like James said, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And I don't know about you, but I know that there are things in my life that I could really use some wonderful results. Amen? Amen? Teenagers, are there any of you out there that are dealing with something that you would love to have some wonderful results? Yeah, absolutely. That's the second part of how we can open up. And here's the third and final way to open up. And this is, again, for everybody in the room, Steve. The third and and final way that we can actually open up is stop hiding your weakness. Stop hiding your hurt. Stop lying about needing help with what you need help with. They, listen, we don't need to have these grand stories of, 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 of bad friends and, and alcohol and drugs and smoking cigarettes and harmful families. It can be things like trusting God with my future. It can be things, anything, everything at all. Acknowledge that you need help. Open up with your weakness. Open up about the thing. Surrender the thing that you have been doing that's sinful. Paul, one of the most well-known writers uh, in in Scripture and also probably one of the most well-known evangelists, um, he loved Jesus with his whole heart. I mean, you know that just by reading one of his first letters. He loved Jesus with his whole heart, and he lived a life, like he legitimately lived a life committed to spreading the gospel. It's because of him, I mean, it's because of the Holy Spirit, but it's because of the Holy Spirit in Paul that we have so many churches that started. He was like the original church, actually, he is the original church planner. And so did you know that Paul actually dealt with something that was hard? Did you know that there was actually something that Paul referenced as a thorn in his flesh? Something that hurt him, something that he struggled with so much that it hurt him that he went to God because he was struggling. He went to God often to God. He would often go to God with this because he was struggling because it was hurtful to him. And here's the deal. Check this out. Listen to what happens because he goes to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Pay attention. Listen to this. This is a person just like me or you, a human just like me and you dealing with hurts 
in his life. And this is what happens. He says, three times I begged the Lord to take it away. Three times I went to God. He kept track. And this is Paul, one of those guys. He didn't just do like daily devotions. His life was a daily devotion. And three times he intentionally went to God and said, God, please take this from me. Remove this from me. Scripture continues, each time he said, who said? God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So Paul continues, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecution and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul, one of the most renowned writers of Scripture, opening up for us. Here he stands, vulnerable, opening up, confessing that there is something. Now, real quick before I go on, I want to point something out. We never learn what it is Paul's dealing with. Of course, there are some of those professional theologians who'd like to debate what they believe it could be, but the reality is it doesn't say. And I think there's some really powerful point to that, and here it is, because our hurt doesn't get to identify us. So it doesn't matter what Paul's struggling with. The fact is Paul struggled. He went to God, and God said to him, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. God responds to Paul's request with, my grace is enough. And Paul discovers exactly that. I want you to know what I want you to know right now. Paul discovers exactly what it is I want you to know right now. You see, when we take off the mask and open up, when we surrender, when we confess, God's power will come through us. When we confess to God, uh, uh, his power will come through us and we share with another person so that their prayer, their prayer can bring results. The God who created us, the one who gets to define us, is safe for us to open up to. Listen, look at my eyes, everybody. Listen to this. When you know whose you are, you know who you are. And when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. God has given you purpose. Paul said again in 2 Corinthians, so now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. My freshman year of high school, My favorite teacher, Ms. Hillman, had us write in a journal. Where do you believe you'll be at the age of 21? And as I sat in the class, looking at this journal, I knew exactly what to write. Dead. I'll be dead. And I could tell you detail after detail about how I pursued that to be true. But God is sovereign. And I'm telling you right now, standing in this room, in this place, that I'm a person who has experienced exactly what Paul just said. By confessing my weakness, God is doing something amazing. (laughs) I'm here with you. I'm here with you. I want to invite everybody just to stand up right now. We're going to pray, and I believe with my whole heart that there is somebody in this room who has been wrestling with a mask, the I'm fine mask. So what I want you to do, I want everybody to do this. I want you to close your eyes. And check this out. If you're the type of person who says, Steve, I can't close my eyes. I want to, but it's too hard. I'm going to ask you just to put your head down. And if you can close your eyes, you can keep your head up. And as I pray, I just want you to hear the words that come out of my mouth. And if they resonate with your heart, if you feel like God is speaking to you, then I want you to respond to those words by raising your hand. Let's pray. Jesus, with my whole heart, I know you are who you say you are. 
And I believe, Father, that you came to this earth to live a life as man, to surrender and sacrifice who you are for me and my sin, my brokenness, my hurt, my mask. And so, God, it's through your name I pray this prayer with these people right now. Jesus, have my life. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that you are the Son of God, and I believe that only through your death can I experience new life. And so, Father, Jesus, I'm taking my mask off right now. I'm done with the hurt. I'm done letting fear dictate my life. If that's you, if you're ready to take that mask off, I want you just to raise your right hand. It doesn't have to be high. It doesn't have to be low. You raise it for you. I'm not even looking. This is between you and God. Jesus, you know the cries of our hearts. You know whose hands are held. You know who who it is that's struggling. Father, I pray that through your Holy Spirit that each one of us would experience your presence in a brand new way right now. We have been adopted into your family. We are children of the sovereign king, Jesus Christ. Have your way with us, Jesus, we pray. Amen.